For this video, I wanted to explore chemiluminescence. This reaction is quite unique, as instead of producing heat as a product, it produces light, causing for the production of a spectacular blue glow. Luminol is popular in forensic science because of its reaction with blood. Iron within the hemoglobin catalyzes the reaction, exposing the location of trace amounts of blood. The luminol reaction also is related to the reaction within fireflies, as their glow is similar. At the end of this video, I also plan on attempting to create different colors instead of the standard blue glow caused by the luminol. This goes pretty well and stick to the end of the video to be able to see this. To get started, I prepare my workstation and gather the required chemicals. In the reaction's most basic form, all we need is the luminol, a base, in this case sodium hydroxide, and an oxidizing solution, in this case household bleach. To begin, a 200 milliliter beaker is set out on a stir plate and filled with about 50 milliliters of water. The exact amount of water is irrelevant since we are going to be diluting the solution to 100 milliliters after the luminol and base are added. The only important consideration is to not add 100 milliliters or more of water immediately. I turn the stirring on and measure out 0.4 grams of sodium hydroxide. This is then added to the beaker and left to dissolve. The purpose of the base is to react with the luminol to produce a dianion. Luminol as is is unable to dissolve in water, yet the dianion is. After a couple of minutes of stirring, the sodium hydroxide is finally dissolved and I can add the luminol. We can now move on to adding 0.046 grams of luminol to the solution. This solution is then mixed well. Once the luminol has completely mixed, we can finish by diluting the mixture to 100 milliliters. Solution A is now complete for this reaction. Moving on to the second solution, one milliliter of bleach is added to a clean 100 milliliter beaker. With the bleach added, distilled water is then used to dilute the solution to 100 milliliters. The volume of the two solutions must be equal when combined. With the volume of the second solution up to 100 milliliters, we are ready for the reaction. The two solutions are placed next to each other, along with a large 500 milliliter beaker. I add the first solution, which contains the luminol, into the beaker, careful not to dump in the stir bar. With the 200 milliliter beaker out of the way, and the second solution in position, I turn out the lights. As I pour the solution into the 500 milliliter beaker, a soft blue glow is produced, illuminating the table. While light is produced, it is quite faint. It is notable how long the reaction is lasting, however. This is due to the fact that no catalyst was used to help the reaction in luminol speed up. With the catalyst, however, much more light is produced, which is ideal. I quickly turn on the lights to show how there is no color change, and the solution remains clear. To produce more light instead of a longer reaction, chemicals must be changed for the second demonstration. In this demonstration, the primary solution contains sodium carbonate, which I found off of Amazon for a relatively cheap price under the common name soda ash, sodium bicarbonate, ammonium carbonate, luminol, and cupric sulfate pentahydrate, which was purchased as a rock by the name of chalcomphite. Even though it is likely hardly pure, it would have been a waste of money to buy chemical cupric sulfate pentahydrate when this would work relatively the same and would also double as a rock for my shelf. Now with all the chemicals obtained, we can begin by putting a 1 liter flask on a stir plate and filling it to about 300 milliliters with distilled water. This measurement is also irrelevant, since we will be diluting the solution to 500 milliliters. The same considerations previously mentioned also apply. With water in the flask, stirring is turned on low. 2.0 grams of sodium carbonate is weighed out, then added and left to dissolve. I used a wash bottle to wash down some of the sodium carbonate because it hit the side of the flask. I also washed the beaker to make sure no sodium carbonate was left behind. Once most of the sodium carbonate is dissolved, water starts condensing on the inside of the flask. This was likely caused by small temperature changes when the sodium carbonate was dissolved. I went to touch the flask yet it didn't feel cold. 
I grabbed the wash bottle, however, to wash it away, and that seemed to resolve it. The purpose of the sodium carbonate was to make the solution basic. Since the carbonate ion is polyprotic, some of the carbonate ions react with present H plus ions, causing for the pH to be lowered. Now that basic conditions are met, the luminol is added to the solution and dissolved. I again use the wash bottle to make sure all of the luminol is added. Once the luminol is completely dissolved, we can move on to dissolving 12 grams of sodium bicarbonate. Once that beaker is washed, 0.21 grams of ammonium carbonate is dissolved. Ammonium carbonate smells heavily of ammonia and must be handled with in a well-ventilated area. After that dissolves, I break off some of the chalcanthite to measure out 0.2 grams. Once that is added, the solution begins to turn more blue the more the chalcanthite dissolves. As soon as that is dissolved, the solution is raised to 500 milliliters with distilled water. Solution 1 is now complete. The final solution is made from diluted hydrogen peroxide. 25 milliliters of 3% hydrogen peroxide is added to a 500 milliliter beaker. This is then diluted to 500 milliliters with distilled water. Since hydrogen peroxide spontaneously decomposes to water and oxygen gas, it is used as the oxidizing solution. The reaction is as follows. The luminal dianion reacts with present O2. This oxygen replaces the nitrogen within the dianion. This produces nitrogen gas, which is hard to see in the videos, but it does bubble out. This also produces an excited molecule. This excited molecule goes through a process called inner system crossing, which at its most basic is that there's an excited electron which occupies the same spin as the electron on the energy shell below. Due to the Pauli exclusion principle, this electron can't drop down to the energy shell below because the two electrons would have the same spin. This process, inner system crossing, is when the electron switches spin, becoming opposite to the electron below. Now that the electron can obey the Pauli exclusion principle if it drops, it drops an energy level and gives off some energy in the form of blue light. Finally, we can test our, our improved reaction. I grabbed 50 milliliters of each solution and put them in separate beakers. With a clean 200 milliliter beaker on hand, I pour the solution containing the luminol and the catalyst in. I forgot to mention that the catalyst is present in order to increase the amount of oxygen gas produced, which ultimately creates a bread reaction. With the luminol solution in the beaker and the hydrogen peroxide solution ready, I turn the lights out and pour them together. As soon as the two solutions collide, we can see a strong blue glow brighter than the previous experiment. The light quickly fades, however. Compared to the previous experiment, we can see that these solutions create lots of light, but then die down fast. The light is much stronger than the first experiment. The light produces quite beautiful, and is always amazing to see with your own eyes. Now that we have finished with creating blue light, I wanted to experiment with more colors. I still had 450 milliliters of luminol solution, and 450 milliliters of the hydrogen peroxide solution left. To create the different colors, I used highlighter ink. One of the main ingredients in highlighter ink is fluorescein. This should be able to change the color. To make more colors, I used different colored highlighters including blue, purple, and pink. Also, I wanted to use a different coloring agent, so I used standard food coloring, which is red. I added the different colors to the solution of hydrogen peroxide. I show how I did it with the standard fluorescein, but it is the same process I use for all in the future. Simply add some fluorescein, and then mix. The fluorescein looks quite interesting when added. With the two solutions ready, it was time to see if different colors were possible. I pour the blue solution which contains the luminol into the clean 200 milliliter beaker and turn out the lights. When the fluorescein and hydrogen peroxide is poured into the solution, a bright green glow is produced. Multiple colors are definitely possible now. This light is even brighter than normal, actually. This is likely due to the fluorescein amplifying the light due to its optic properties. Now that I know multiple colors are possible, I continue to prepare the blue highlighter. Like before, I pour the luminol into the 200 milliliter beaker and turn the lights off. A bright blue glow is produced. In retrospect, this reaction was very unnecessary since the luminol already produces blue light and nothing was changed. Yet it still looks cool and it does produce light. Moving on to the second color test. 
This time I used the purple highlighter. With that solution prepared, I worked through the same steps of pouring the luminol and turning out the lights. When combined, the light produces a very hot pink, and then, very quickly, it transforms to a mellow purple, and then back to the base blue. I'm not exactly sure why it did this, yet it is definitely one of the coolest tests done so far. The final highlighter ink test was with the pink highlighter. When mixed with the hydrogen peroxide, however, it seemed to be more of an orange. With the luminol in the beaker and the lights out once more, I mix them together to find out it is an orange, but instead a definitive pink. While you can't see it in the video, the reason it was so interesting is because of the colors they made when I first poured them together. There was almost like a swirling of purple and pink within the luminol solution. The reason I think the different colors are being made is because it is like the light is passing through a film. For example, white light passing through a piece of blue glass turns the white light blue. So the blue light produced by luminol will simply be the combination of whatever it is passing through. Looking at a color wheel, you can see that the combo of yellow and blue makes green. Orange and blue should cancel out, but it appears due to unequal proportions it made pink, and so on. To test this theory, I wanted to use a different coloring agent without fluorescein that would simply color the water. Food coloring was the obvious candidate, and I prepared the solution with red food coloring. Now with everything set, I mix them together and a very soft purple is emitted. The theory seems to be correct, since red and blue make purple. Yet there wasn't very extensive research done into it, and it was just a couple of tests. This concludes my research and testing into chemiluminescence. I hope you enjoyed. This is my first video, and if you would like to see more, please let me know. I also plan on doing many other videos on topics such as astronomy, computer science, rocketry, physics, and of course chemistry. Thank you for watching.